here once again for God Loves Comics, and this is the GLC essay, Frank Frazetta, Genius of Violence. I've been working on this a long time, so let's get to it. While other artists of his era, including Matt Baker, Wallace Wood, and Bill Ward, could occasionally approach Frank Frazetta's sensuality, none could match the visceral power of his scenes of violence. Even among his many celebrated EC peers, no one could land a punch quite like Frazetta. This is not to conflate pugilism with gore. Great cartoonists such as Jack Davis, Graham Ingalls, and even Johnny Craig could lop off heads and other appendages with the best of them, but Frazetta maintained his own artistic boundaries where violence could hurt but never disgust. By the same token, the sensuality of Frazetta's characters, both male and female, was so overt that they never needed cross Frazetta's own distinct boundaries. Had Frazetta deigned to venture into erotica, he would have superseded the subsequent masters of the realm. From Crepax and Minara to Serpieri and fellow Flegel, the aforementioned Wally Wood. But Frazetta instead maintained a classicist concept of sensuality and nudity. Frank Frazetta was only 21 years old when he began illustrating his impressively accomplished white Indian strips in 1949's Durango Kid from Magazine Enterprises. The stories were written by Gardner Fox, a popular and prolific writer nearly two decades Frazetta Sr. But in the thousands of comics Fox would write over his career, he would surely never work with another artist as naturally gifted as the precocious Frazetta. Decades later, Fox would tap Frazetta, by then a globally famous fantasy illustrator, to paint covers for his novels The Warrior of Lorne and The Conquering Prince. The latter cover is especially fascinating as Frazetta clearly draws himself both as a title character barely sheathed in a toga as well as the chariot driver at the feet of the prince. Frazetta, despite his claims against photographic reference, was shameless in transposing his own ruggedly handsome face and physique onto the physiques of his male protagonist. While Frazetta is often remembered for a line and figure work so sensual that even a mercenary taking on a horde of simian barbarians could somehow appear erotic, Frazetta was equally adept with scenes of visceral pugilism and violence. More than any of his predecessors, peers, or the subsequent generations of artists he influenced, Frazetta had an innate understanding of the impact physics of a punch. Looking solely at Frazetta's work on the White Indian Strips, you see a startling facility for illustrating realistic violence that few, if any, artists of his generation were capable of. Jack Kirby understood the brutish ballet of a street fight because he claimed to have been a mini himself. But a Kirby punch still had a hyper-dramatic cartoonish quality in the superhero books, and while more realistic in some of Kirby's other genre work, he could never hope to approach the mandible fracturing realism of a Frazetta drubbing. While Kirby would almost always defer to tried-and-true visual language of comic books, complete with sound effects and splashes of negative space to indicate impact, Frazetta eschewed that language and illustrated the actual connecting of flesh on bone, bone on bone, so that his punches looked every bit as dynamic as Kirby's, but vastly more painful, more impactful, and more viscerally destructive. Teeth were loosened, Jaws were cracked, and skin was pushed to the limits of his elasticity and Frazetta's percussive pugilism. As for many lesser artists, we've all seen the innumerable images of characters with awkward and unbelievable punches being thrown from impossible angles with imaginary physics that register as false in our eyes, regardless of our understanding or lack thereof of such physics. These are all superb cartoonists and storytellers simply using the baked-in language of comics to create action unavailable to or certainly less well-articulated in other storytelling mediums. Frazetta, however, was clearly working from a different satchel of influences and rarely considered resorting to tropes when he could apply his own technique and uniquely skillful approach. In any white Indian story, you can find at least one or two exceptional panels of violence that are bracing in their realism and yet wouldn't have triggered a single censor at the Comics Code Authority, assuming it had even been in existence at the time. Frazetta's punches radically distort the skin, flesh, and fat in the combatant's face, capturing the exact moment of impact in a way that might seem wildly exaggerated. However, given a cursory look at still photos from every era of boxing, 
and its most iconic athletes, from Joe Lewis and Jake LaMotta to Sugar Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran to Mike Tyson and Manny Pacquiao, you see the same Frazetta-esque distortions in real life. Nevertheless, in a 1994 interview with Steven Serio, Frazetta championed imagination over rote duplication of reality. He said, quote, I have watched artists refer to models and photography and become enslaved by it. Next thing you know, they can't draw, can't think. It's an absolute fact. They get so damn lazy. They find using the model and photographs made the painting look very realistic and they become entranced by that fact. That's precisely what I don't want. I want it to look dreamlike. I want it to look made up. I want it to look unreal. Unquote. But while Frazetta's fertile imagination and his fantasy paintings is beyond doubt, Frazetta was unquestionably looking at still photos from boxing matches of his era, as well as freeze-framing images in his brilliant visual mind, perhaps from fights he had seen in person. The standard for violent interaction in comics typically is a panel of foreplay, in other words, winding up a punch, and the immediate aftermath of the punch being thrown. The puncher's arm foregrounding his body as a focal point of the action, and the punch victim's body being thrown backwards by the force, perhaps with a contortion of the head to one side, corresponding with the physics of the punch. Most artists wouldn't intellectually dissect this, but simply absorb it as a standard language of comics, which clearly communicates that a punch has been thrown and connected. I don't believe Frank Frazetta dissected this language either other than to probably find the approach terribly weak in his own eyes and to innately apply both the sensibility of an athlete or a boxer, a man who had actually thrown and connected a real punch with that of an extraordinarily talented draftsman who could actually execute the exact moment of contact, not solely the foreplay in the aftermath, but the tout midsection featuring all the facial contortions and kinetic energy of a force striking a very movable and malleable fleshy object. So all this anal gazing analysis aside, Frank Frazetta knew how to throw a punch. And more importantly, he knew how to draw one. Naysayers may argue that by illustrating the connective moment, that Frazetta was robbing the reader of imagining it instead, and maybe more potently than it could ever be drawn. That argument can have some basis in comics, particularly when the artist's illustration could in no way top the collective reader's imagination. But to extrapolate and apply it to all comics would of course mean eliminating comics entirely. Comics without pictures imagined first by the creators are simply prose. Possibly the most visceral image in White Indian is not of a punch, but of a chokehold exploding with kinetic motion and energy in which Frazetta draws a forearm, indenting a man's esophagus with such force that no reader with even a scintilla of imagination couldn't envision having their oxygen cut off at that moment and the feeling of their windpipe collapsing. This may be a greater testament to Frazetta's imagination than the punches, which potentially have some reference. Finding photo refs for such a chokehold in the 50s may have been a far more difficult task, unless Frazetta had access to police brutality photos where they were surely quite common, and unfortunately still are. While Frazetta's bone-crunching punches were mostly hidden away across a smattering of panels and obscure Golden Age titles, his most famous scene of comic art violence was evidenced on the cover of EC Comics. In the Christian Bible's Book of Judges, a fantastical action scene occurs in which the pious strongman Samson reportedly slays a thousand pagan Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. If ever there were an artist perfectly suited to illustrate such a scene, it was Frank Frazetta. But Frazetta's Samson moment instead came courtesy of Wayward Buck Rogers and EC Comics, the latter of which has near-biblical stature amongst discerning comics fans. On what is possibly the single greatest cover in the history of comics, Weird Science Fantasy 29, Frazetta channels the sheer primitive brutality of prehistoric man drawn flawlessly as something almost three quarters of the way to fully evolve from their ape-like origins. Of course, let's ignore the conflict of evolution and biblical fantasies to see the parallels between a fearsome hero hacking away savage enemies with, if not a weaponized bone, an equally primitive club.
Despite being drafted before the implementation of the Comics Code, Rosetta's scene originally intended as a Buck Rogers cover for Famous Funnies was deemed too violent and thus rejected. With slight alterations, only to distance it from the Buck Rogers copyright, a vastly more intrepid EC Comics ran it as a final cover of their merged title, Weird Science Fantasy. Sadly, the rising tide of censorship had already crippled EC's flagship titles, but one of the finest comic book covers in history was nevertheless rescued from the unpublished scrappy. On the cover, the Neanderthal, club raised and attacking the protagonist, has very ape-like facial features, but mostly hairless pale limbs and skin. Yet in the mouth of the cave, watching on fearfully, are two more chimp-like creatures. One with hairy arms looks clearly chimp, while the other appears somewhat more evolved. It may simply be lighting, but you could surmise that Frazetta is showing a variety of closely related human ancestors at various stages along the evolutionary chain. A very unique take and an incredibly well thought out subtext that maybe wasn't even consciously constructed by Frazetta, who always seemed more of a force of nature genius than a cautiously contrived intellect. For his futuristic traveler's weapon, there is no flaccid ray gun, its beam bouncing weakly off the chest of savage attackers. Instead, Frazetta gives his protagonist the same gnarled, spiky wooden club of his simian assailants. The man-ape's feet are extraordinary, appearing both human and ape-like at the same time, and every single element from the fleshy figures to the clubs to the tatters of cloth and the fur to the cracked and pockmarked cave walls is drawn with an organic sensibility that makes it all appear as living, breathing entities in this simplistic struggle between life and death. Also interesting is that Frazetta creates some ambivalence and perhaps even sympathy for his supposed antagonist. They aren't merely hostile green aliens with fangs or the clearly nefarious villains of the Golden Age, but rather human ancestors still evolving, yet no more savage really than Frazetta's Buck Rogers archetype. In fact, they are merely defending their home. Indeed, a considerable part of Frazetta's genius is not only his extraordinary facility, but also the moral ambiguity that comes with the artist connecting to the primal savagery of his death dealers, his barbaric heroes, and demonic goddesses. With their lust for blood and copious eyeliner, Frazetta's protagonists often look no less savage nor frightening than their attackers. Finally, let's return to the punches. The disembodied head, essentially floating necklace in a negative space of a panel with no background, is a comic book convention Frazetta would not return to again as his work rapidly evolved. The cartoony conventions of such a panel are unusual for Frazetta, and yet even so there is the heightened realism of a face distorted by a punch, both eyes clenched shut, teeth gritted, and cheeks wrinkled like a sharpe. The bone structure of the fist looks remarkably believable, and a lone vein curls down just above the gnarled thumb. Ultimately, Frank Frazetta, perhaps the most prodigiously talented painter to ever work in fantasy illustration or certainly comics, is often most remembered for his sumptuous figure drawing, both male and female. But while there are far fewer examples of Frazetta's mastery of violence, given that so many of his paintings were either the preludes, interludes, or aftermaths of conflict, Frank Frazetta, even from the most precocious age, can rightfully also be considered a prodigious genius of violence.